God has given us for which we have not labored. Six things God has given us for which we have not labored. Uh, so the, the theme verse of this lesson comes from Joshua chapter 24 and verse 13. Uh, and in the context of that chapter, God had just given the Israelites the land of Canaan. Uh, the Israelites had fought hard for this land, as God told them to, and God provided. In fact, in verse 3 of that chapter, the text says that God had fought for Israel uh, to provide them with this land that they received. And now listen to what God says in our, in our text of Joshua 24 and verse 13. So God says, after he's given them the land, he says, Israel... I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves uh, which you did not plant. Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Uh, So the concept that I want to explore this morning uh, is the goodness of our God, who often provides humanity with things for which we did not deserve, and he provides us with things that we did not even labor for. And he gives us a gift. Uh, so God gives us access to blessings for which we didn't earn it. And we didn't labor for it. And our God is just a good God. Uh, you know, Israel, when they were receiving the land, might have replied back to God and said, well, what do you mean that this is a land for which we did not labor? Right? Uh, we, we just fought a war conquering the promised land. And Israel had fought. Just like God told them to. But God would say, well, no, I'm talking about how I set this land apart for you out of my good free will. Okay, You didn't convince me that you were worthy of it. It was a gift that you were able to work for it. And that's sort of the way it works with God. That there's a grace component to how God uh, operates. So God said to Israel, essentially, you know, because you followed my direction, you now enter into this land with fully furnished buildings that you didn't build. Because you followed me, you eat from vineyards and olive groves, which you didn't plant and labor for. You just inherit it. All of these things I have providentially provided for you. So this was my doing, according to my plan, that you should receive this blessing of your conquest. So God would say, yeah, you did play your part. You played your part well. And it took my grace plus your faith to produce what I have given you. Um, And you did what I told you to do uh, to receive it. But ultimately, you enter the promised land because of me. I provided it. Can you imagine what it was like for the Israelites to wander about the wilderness for 40 years, to stay in their tents and have no permanent dwellings, and then to get to go enter these fully built, fully furnished cities? They had beds in them. They had couches, you know, whatever it was already in there, and they got to inherit it. Each uh, city of promise upon capturing was ready to be inhabited instantly, and they could go and enter in. So imagine yourself as an Israelite. After the battle has been won, you get to walk into a deserted city. All the enemies gone, and you get their city. You get to take the inheritance of whatever you like. You know, you walk down a street, that you and your people did not build. You pick from fruit trees which you and your people did not plant. But the wicked people who lived in the land before you had done all the work. And God put it into your pocket. He provided it for you, God's people. You walk into an an 1,800 square foot house of one of the former Canaanites who you just drove out of the land or uh, that God told you to kill them. Uh, And God says, this is your house now. You know, for us, it might be like God today saying, hey, listen, you know, I've, I've had everybody out in Beverly Hills, California, move out of their houses, and I want you all to pick up your bags and go pick out a house that you like, and he provides it for you. You know, you walk into a mansion and say, wow, I didn't build this house. You know, I don't deserve this house. I didn't labor for it, but God has given this to me as a blessing a blessing for which I did not labor. You know, I'd pick one with a pool out back, by the way. I love swimming. Um, but you see, you know, this really is a similar thought process of how the Israelites, you know, when they received the land, would have thought of this promised land in the Old Testament. You know, the land that they were told for years and years was flowing with milk and honey. 
and they were ready to inherit it as God's gift. And he said, I've given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build. Uh, and you eat from vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. So in this lesson, I want to point out that the goodness of our God has often given blessings to people throughout the history of the world uh, by which they neither deserved them nor did they even work for them. But God is just a good and a giving God. We're going to talk about six things God has given us for which we have not labored and we didn't deserve. So this is a grace lesson, I suppose you could say. All these things we're going to talk about we didn't deserve. Uh, So number one, let's talk about the creation. Today, there is not one of us here on planet Earth who did anything to deserve the marvelous creation of God and all the things we enjoy down here. Not a single member of mankind has ever put his hand to a tool to create this vast universe that we live in and nature. Not a single human put uh, any work into earning the beauties of what we get to enjoy while we're here on the earth. Nobody. Amen. The point is, God made everything and he gave it to us. And our God made the heavens, the stars, the moon, the sun, everything in this physical and material universe God made. And let me ask you the question, do we as humans take enjoyment from God's work, his creation? You better believe we do. You know, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 12, Solomon says of humanity, he says, I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. So the Bible says it is God's gift for you to enjoy the wonderful fruits that you work for in this life and you work with the creation. It says it's God's gift. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 18, Solomon says, here's what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor for which he toils under the sun all the days of his life, which God has given him for it is his heritage. So let me ask you the question, does God want mankind to enjoy his wonderful creation? Yeah, it's why he gave it to us. Uh, And, you know, we put our hand to the plow. He wants us to enjoy the harvest. We use God's resources to build a house. He wants us to enjoy the house. And that was why he gave us these things. You You know, we work hard to love our families and God wants us to enjoy our families and the church here. You know, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17 says, God gives us richly all things to enjoy. So he's bestowing goodness, at, you know, wanting us to pursue him. And by the way, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45 says, He makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. <laughs> so I just find it interesting that God allows both the righteous and the wicked to enjoy the wonders of creation. Uh, God creates these things with enjoyment in mind for all mankind, not just people who love God. And that shows the grace of our God, even in the creation. Now, you might think of what we have here on the earth, the colors of the sky at certain times of years of, of the year, uh, the color of the changing leaves in the fall time, the white snow that falls in the winter time, the beauty and the warmth that comes in the summer. And we could talk about some of the awesome foods that we get to eat on this planet. Uh, meats and plants, fruits and breads, and I put ice cream on my list, uh, making, making sure that's always up on the screen. He's given us all things richly to enjoy. Uh, and the wicked of this world get to enjoy these things as well. All people, whether you're righteous or wicked, God is letting everybody enjoy the creation by His grace. Uh, our God is so good to the entirety of mankind. You know, regardless of how they feel about him, he's still blessing them. Isn't that interesting? And when it comes to giving us the creation, the righteous and the wicked have access to God's glorious blessings on the earth that we all do. Because you know, even the wicked get to take fun vacations. They get to go and see planet earth and explore and enjoy. Even the wicked get to see the beautiful sights of God's world. Yet none of us did anything to deserve these blessings. Our God is just good to do all these things. But, you know, of course, for those who will not pursue God with a loving and a thankful heart, you know, they will only enjoy these blessings for the time they have on the earth. 
and then they die and won't get any more enjoyment out of God's goodness. Afterward, if we don't approach God on the earth with thankfulness and humility for everything he's done, if we don't have that attitude, then he will take away his blessings and we will not be in his presence for eternity. And that's really what uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse 21 talks about. Uh, it talks about how the wicked of times past got to enjoy it. Like we're doing and all the wicked of this world, we're getting to enjoy God's goodness, but they grew very selfish and unthankful. Uh, and they were condemned because of their attitude. The verse says, because although they knew God, right, they saw all of his blessings. They knew there was a God. They knew God. They did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. But they became futile, and their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. So their lack of thankfulness is what led them into being selfish and getting this attitude of probably, I, I deserve these things. These are my things. And there was a departure from God's goodness after they were unthankful. And uh, eventually they lost all those things that they were not thankful for. So I want you to think for a moment about your physical possessions. We've been mindful in our prayers this morning of all of our blessings. And you know, I, I, for me personally, I think of the, the house that me and Betty get to live in. We love living here. Still can't believe that we were lucky enough to find that neat little house for our first home. And we love it. Um, and you know, Betty and I might be tempted to say, yeah, but, but we work for that house. Uh, you know, we put in long hours uh, for our jo- in our jobs to save up for it, and we labored to obtain it. You know, but just like the Israelites who labored for the land of Canaan that God was providing them uh, and put in some work for it, man- mankind can put in work to benefit from God's creation Right? Uh, builders build and we, we work with our hands and these things, but we have to remember whatever we make down here or whatever we benefit from, it's still God's creation. Right? Uh, you know, God put Adam and Eve on this vast, large, empty planet Earth to inhabit. It's a big house, isn't it? For two people. And so he said, I've made all of this for you and your descendants. Be fruitful, and I want you to multiply. Scatter across all the earth. Fill the earth and subdue it. Overtake the earth, as it's essentially your house. And so when humanity went out and they would cut down trees uh, to build houses with, we realized that we're benefiting from God's world, God's materials. We said, but that's my house. You know, well, it's God's trees. You know, when a farmer puts a seed in the ground and then benefits from the harvest and they're tempted to boast about it, we need to remember, well, God provided the seed. God provided the soil. And when you drive that nice car or you live in that nice house, you realize that the metals came from the earth, the plastic came from the earth, all the materials came from God. So all of these things men have worked with based off of what God provided at the creation. Due to no doing of our own, God just loved us and provided it for us. It reminds me of the illustration where a scientist and God had a conversation with one another. Uh, The scientist said, you know, God, I've studied your creation so thoroughly. And now, since I understand how it all works, I can recreate anything that you can because I studied all these things. God says to the scientist, Can you make a plant grow up from nothing? The scientist said, I sure can. And he grabs a handful of dirt to start with to show show God his point. And God says, now hold on, wait a minute. That's my dirt. You get your own dirt. Because God started with nothing. Can you start from nothing? Right? You got to get your own seed. That's my seed. And we understand the point. Every workable piece of material that we can benefit from and do things with and labor with was provided for us here on the earth by God. It was brought into existence by the power of God. And man didn't work for it. From the tiny molecules of this universe to the giant stars out in our solar system and out in the universe, our God created the material universe from nothing. And we realize that this creation wasn't given to humans because we work for it. But I have given you a land for which you did not labor. I think that's something he's practically said to all humanity when talking about the earth. So number one, God gave us the creation. Number two, I want to talk about the love of God. There is a certain component to God's love for humanity that is in fact unconditional. 
okay, by which he loves us based off of nothing we've done. We're, you know, we're talking about the universal love that God has for all of his creation. Of course, there is also the sense in which the Bible talks about God's conditional love, that it will not, you will not have an abiding love, continuing love, if you are not good yourself, if you don't love him, if you don't obey him. For example, uh, Psalm chapter 5, verses 4 through 6, uh, David says to God, he says, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. And note here, it doesn't say he hates the sin. It says he hates the workers of iniquity. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood, and the Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful men. He abhor- That's a strong word. He can't stand the bloodthirsty and deceitful men. Psalm chapter 11, verse 5, The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. So there is a sense uh, in which the Bible says that God loves the righteous and he hates the wicked. Yes, that's what the Bible teaches. But there's also a sense in which the Bible talks about, in which, does the Bible say that God loves the wicked? Yes. All right. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 11, we see the love of, that God has for wicked people. Okay. In spite of his hatred for the evil in their heart, the text says, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But what do you wish, God? That the wicked turn from his evil way and live. So that's what I want for the wicked, God says. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die? I have no pleasure in the death of a wicked person, God says. So, of course, the Bible talks about a sense in which God still loves a wicked man in spite of his wickedness and hopes that he will repent. And he extends this grace. And the New Testament draws this out so well of this unconditional type of love that's been extended to humanity. And he gives it to all mankind. That he does love all mankind. We, you know, we read in our New Te- Testaments about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that has been sent out because God loves the whole human family, not just the people who seem to deserve it. The famous passage, John chapter 3, and verse 16 and 17, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So we read about a love that God has for all, uh, for which we did not labor for to earn a love like this. He didn't do anything to send Jesus down. It was God's doing. Uh, and not a one of us did anything to earn this type of love. So our, our God loved us actually in spite of our sins, the Bible teaches, in spite of our undesirable tendencies, and there was goodwill toward us anyway, even though we didn't deserve us. That's the grace aspect of the gospel. First uh, John chapter 4 and verse 19 teaches, that we, we say we love him because he first loved us. It started with God. So in response to that love that he had for us, we're now going to love him in return. Second uh, Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the whole of humanity. So yes, God has a love for the whole human family. And here's the thing about this love. No human did anything to work for this love. No human did anything to earn this love, but in fact, just the opposite. He loved mankind in spite of the fact that man had not earned it. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. That's what our payment should be, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he sent out a love for which we did not labor. Uh, And that's where you get the phrase in Scripture that it was by grace. Uh, For by grace you have been saved, he says to Christians, through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. I picture the Canaanites or the, the Israelites entering into the land of Canaan. And that was the gift of God for which they had not labored. Not of works, lest any man should boast, because this is God's doing. But here's a good question. Even though God loved us all, as all of humanity, does that mean that everyone will benefit from that love in eternity? 
If the Bible says that God loves everyone, does that mean everyone is going to dwell with him forever and ever and ever in heaven? The Bible doesn't teach that. Romans chapter 11 and verse 22 talks about those who, who fall from that as being cut off from God. That is, once we reject his love long enough, eventually there is a point in the future to where human souls will not be able to benefit from God's love any longer. So this is after the judgment, after your death. But for those who will continue to benefit from it, for, for us in this room, hopefully, we will all realize that it was by grace, that we didn't deserve it. And so number one, God unconditionally gave us the creation. Not a one of us deserved that goodness. Not a one of us earned this temporary home at all, but God was just good, so he gave it to us. Number two, the same can be said about the unconditional sense in which God has a love for the whole world. Right? In spite of the fact that we are unlovable, God has goodwill toward all mankind and hopes that everyone will repent of their wrong. Now, number three, let's talk about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's sacrifice. So God's love for all men was demonstrated by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 teaches, it says, But God demonstrated his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So did the Father send Jesus to die for us because we deserved it? No. Uh, did he send Jesus to die because we were good? No. Right? We were sinners, and God still sent his son. Uh, Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5 says, But when the kindness, I like that word, the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared. That's mankind, by the way. Not of works of righteousness which we have done. Right? It wasn't our righteousness that prompted God to say, well, let me send Jesus. Not, according, not, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Through the washing of regeneration, that's baptism, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, that involves repentance. All right, the point here is he gave you access to something that you didn't work for. That's the point of grace. Now, you know, you have access to something now that you did not deserve. And that's why it is by grace and not of works in that sense. So this verse says, you know, uh, he didn't send Jesus to die on that cross because of the works that we had done. So he didn't send Jesus to die for Travis Toy because Travis Toy did a good job. You know, he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for Travis Toy because he did poorly and everybody else did poorly. That's why he sent Jesus. And then just like when God was given the children of Israel the promised land by grace, right? They didn't deserve it. You remember that God told them what they had to do to then benefit from his grace. And he gave them a duty, right? God didn't just say, Israel, I love you. And I have this great reward for you, but you don't really have any responsibility on your part whatsoever. Right? God's never done that with his love. All right, so God told them, go take the land. He said, trust me that I have told Israel uh, that they will be successful against the armies of the Canaanites. I'm giving it to them. I'll fight for them. And you will have to inherit the land. Well, you know, what if they're too scared? What if they didn't believe God? Would they have inherited the land? The first generation didn't. That's why they didn't inherit the land, because of their unbelief. And so the next generation, they said, well, you know, led by Joshua. So yes, grace uh, isn't extended because someone deserved what was coming to them. But oftentimes in Scripture, grace is extended with conditions of the Lord attached to it. you got to do this, but you don't deserve it in the first place. Romans chapter 5 and verse 2 tells us that we have access by faith into his grace. That's what the Bible teaches. So that means that we, we realize we don't deserve it. And we have to have that mentality. We understand if we go to heaven, we don't deserve to be there. And then we trust our God, what he's extending by grace, and that we can benefit from it. So you see, you know, Israel, if they would not have fought for, uh, if they would not have fought the Canaanites, you know, if they had fear or if they didn't trust God, even though God loved Israel and extended this opportunity for them, they would not have received the land if they had not also had faith to do what God told them to do. So they would not have benefited from God's grace had they not had faith and works 
to lead them to their salvation. Uh, and so it is with us. Number four, what did God give mankind? Uh, what else did he give which we did not labor for? The offer of grace and mercy. So what we're talking about here is the extension of how man may benefit with God's love. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. All right, so he offered it to everybody. The very thing that mankind doesn't deserve has been offered to all. And anybody can benefit from it. doesn't matter what you've done in your past. We can all benefit from the grace of God, the salvation that's appeared to all men. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 talks about Jesus, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Not just the righteous. He died for the wicked. Uh, Acts chapter 17 and verse 30 says that um, the, the terms of the gospel apply to all men everywhere, that they're told to repent. So you see, you know, we, we all have this offer laid in front of us as humanity. Not a one of us did anything to deserve the offer. That's what we're talking about by grace. Not, one, not a one of us worked for it. Not a one of us earned it. But because God is good, he offered his grace. So the question is, now that you have the offer, what are you going to do with it? You know, Jesus certainly said, not everyone's going to benefit from it. Why not? Because not everybody's going to do the will of the Father. Right? And what Jesus taught, and we put it up here every week, is that, well, first, those who won't hear the gospel, they're, they're not going to, if they don't hear the good news, they're not going to benefit from it. Right? So we need to send out the message into all the world so that the world can know about it. Number two, if a soul doesn't then believe it, Jesus' message and his uh, salvation, then they can't benefit from it. They say, I don't believe that. No, it's not going to help you then, is it? So they must believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, we always talk about they must repent of their sins, which is a change of mind about the way that they are living currently. Uh, repentance is the determination to make a change of life with regards to following God. There needs to be a repentance. Fourth, we must confess the name of Christ admitting that we believe that the message is true, that he is the Son of God. And lastly, in order to enter the kingdom, uh, a sinner must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of his sins, Acts 2.38. So then you get to this point and you get to enter in. I ask the question, does a sinner deserve the remission of sins? Yes or no? No. Right? Did, did a sinner work for or did, did he work to convince God to cleanse him? No. Right? All a sinner has to do is follow the plan that's been laid down by God, and they obey the gospel. But we do not deserve the remission of sins. That's something we got to remember as we live life as a Christian. We've had the remission of sins for several years that we don't take it for granted. You don't deserve to have your sins forgiven. That's grace. That's why uh, we're going to get to make it to heaven. So you, you never have and you never will deserve it. Your forgiveness will always be rooted in God's grace, and you must be diligent then to live your life the way God told you to, to if you want to benefit from the grace. So he says, I will cleanse you. You just have to, well, what do you got to do once you enter in? Remain faithful. Number six, remain faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. That is, I'm going to cleanse you by my grace, and I'll give you the condition. You just got to, uh, you can't go back and live for the devil. Right, you got to stay faithful to me. I'll cleanse you. Revelation 2.10. So faithfulness is our condition, not having to be perfect, but he wants us to be faithful. And we'll have heaven as our home. So unconditionally, number one, we learn that God has extended the creation of the universe to all mankind as a gift. Uh, he gave it whether we were good or bad. Everyone benefits from it. Number two, he loved us. Or, uh, he loved you without doing anything uh, for you to earn it. Number three, he sent Jesus to die for us without uh, us doing anything to earn it. And number four, through Jesus Christ, he offered grace to everybody and mercy to everybody, though we didn't deserve it. And now number five, another good thing that God has given out out of his goodwill toward all mankind for which nobody worked for is the kingdom. That is the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44 in the Old Testament promised that God himself would set up a kingdom that would never be destroyed. It would be a kingdom that would stand 
forever. In the days of John the Baptist, the people started hearing the great message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus came preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He taught his disciples to say, repent for the kingdom's at hand. And after the day of Pentecost, which followed the death of Jesus, uh, the kingdom had been, been established. And it points backward to Acts chapter 2. Back in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus had previously told his apostles, he said, And on this rock, the confession of faith, I will build my church, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom that would be established would be the Lord's church, the church of Christ. It was founded in Jerusalem in AD 33 on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And now today, 2,000 years later, each one of us in this room benefit daily from getting to be a part of this kingdom that he set up. You know, and getting to be a part of God's family. It's just yet another blessing that we benefit from, but we didn't labor for it. You know, what I mean by that is God set up this institution that we're a part of without our help. It's here because of him. We didn't build the church. Right? We didn't work to establish this great kingdom, this worldwide. God did. And he gave us the blueprint. It was all his plan. Jesus built the kingdom, and now we benefit from it. So you benefit from something greatly for which you didn't even labor for it. You know, I, I think a really good verse I'll put up here on the screen is 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. Paul, in the context, was uh, scolding the Christians at Corinth for being puffed up about something. I won't go into the context here, but they were proud being members of the Lord's church. And, you know, though we're not exactly sure the fashion in which they were being proud in the Lord's kingdom, you can probably imagine. Uh, but I like the rhetorical question that he asked them, and he wants them to think about this. And here's what I want us to think about today. He says, and what do you have? that you did not receive. And I think sometimes it's easy for us in the church to get proud for things that we've done, maybe in the kingdom. Uh, you know, Perhaps we lead someone to Jesus Christ by teaching them the gospel, and we get, oh, man, I, I did that. I helped with that. Paul would say, yeah, but you received the gospel from God, right? The seed. It, it, it wasn't your doing. You know, he said of his own preaching, the great apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, well, yeah, I'm, I merely planted the seed that God gave. Apollos watered it, but God gave the increase. Uh, you know, it's like a farmer boasting about his crops before God. You know, look at the corn field that I grew, all that I've done. And God would say, well, yeah, look at the seed I gave you. And the field, Paul said, what do you currently have that you did not receive. I think that's a really good theme for our lesson. Uh, you know, we, we get to be proud about material possessions. And he asked, what do you have that you did not receive? Well, it's my house. I work for it. But God provided you the wood and the, the, the metal, the electricity and all these things. You know, maybe a father or a mother says, well, but, you know, I have a magnificent family. You know, I have a beautiful spouse and three children. And that's, that's my family that came from my genetics. Right? Well, Paul would say, well, who gave you the seed to produce children in the first place? Right? Who gave you arms and legs to work for this family? You know, I challenge you this morning to think of one thing that you might be proud of or, or you, you hold on to it in your life which does not go back to what you receive from God. Because it's not possible to find one thing. Because it all came from God. Every single thing we enjoy. Someone says, well, you know what, but I'm really smart, Travis. Well, God gave you a functioning brain at your birth. It's not your, you know, you, you put work into it, but he gave you something to work with. Someone says, well, I'm wealthy. Yeah, well, God gave you power to get wealth. That's what the Bible says. And he provided you with all these things. And you got born, you were born, all of us here were born in America, the top 3% of the world, and we didn't do anything to deserve that. We just were born here. And so what do you have that you did not receive? So number one, God gave us the creation. Number two, God gave us his love. Number three, God sent his son for everyone. Number four, he extended that grace and mercy to everyone. 
And he provided the kingdom, which, is, which everyone has access to if we want to be a part of it. And now number six, uh, we'll end the lesson by briefly talking about our future reward. Number six, our home in heaven. So God said to the Israelites in the Old Testament, I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and the olive groves which you did not plant. But you know the the physical promised land of the Old Testament was meant to point forward to the spiritual promised land, which is heaven. Okay, you know, we sing the song, I'm bound for the land of Canaan when I die. And that's what the symbolism is here. It's biblical. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 8 says about the land of Canaan, it says, for if Joshua had given them rest, right? He was the leader of the conquest, right? They were going into the physical land of Canaan. It says he would not have afterward told, spoken of another day, of another rest. But what's, what's the verse say? Therefore, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God, not the physical land of Canaan. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. It's talking about heaven, okay? Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you to myself. Who's building the place where we're going to? God, Jesus. In my Father's house are many mansions. So it uh, foreshadowed a land flowing with milk and honey. Do you understand Right, a prosperous land that they were striving for. They kept thinking, well, I can't wait to get to the promised land. And that's where we're going to get to go spiritually, is our promised land. It was foreshadowing it. Uh, where the former things will have passed away. And in the day when we enter heaven's city, we'll enter a land that God is giving us from his own good, goodness. Not a one of us will deserve it. Uh, you know, we'll, we will walk streets of gold that we didn't pave. We'll live in buildings that we didn't build. We'll take uh, the tree of life, which we didn't plant. And the glory will be to God who purposed in his heart to give us these things. We sing the song, Here I labor and toil as I look for a home, just a humble abode among men. While in heaven a mansion is waiting for me and a gentle voice pleading, come in. There's a mansion now empty just waiting for me at the end of life's troublesome way. Many friends, many friends and dear loved ones will welcome me there near the You know the song. (laughs) Near the door of that mansion someday. But that's our gift from God that we have access to. Uh, And I hope that we all can realize that God has done all these things. And he's given us a pathway to get to go to his heaven and get to be with him. And we don't really deserve it. So if you're not a Christian today, you can jump on board with us now that we're going to get to go to that home. And the Bible teaches you have to hear the gospel, believe it, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of sins, confess Him before men, and be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. And you can have access to that home in heaven. you just got to remain faithful until the day that you die, and we'll all get to enter in. So if anybody needs to do that today, and if any Christians uh, have any need of repentance, if you're not ready, if you don't feel like you're going to make it to that home as a Christian, and you need to repent of something, Please come while we stand and sing the invitation song.